Hi and welcome to this episode of the Pete George Experience. Hi, I'm Pete George and welcome to past, present and current listeners. Today's episode uh, will cover a few things. Um, this mainly being about uh, nuclear power and our um, energy minister and how he's wrong in the way he carries on. Uh, Spencer Lanou and his suspension for uh, racial slur and I'll give you a little bit of a summary of what I thought about the Gold Coast Suns on Saturday and we'll have a look at the um, round one fixture so let's get stuck in so one of the things I'd like to uh state from the outset is that there's links in this episode and you can go and have a look at those about what I'm just about to talk about and that's nuclear energy in Australia. Now, um, I believe that we should have it um, and it it, it should be just part of the the whole mix. It's clean, it's efficient. Um, If I can get a link into a video where MIT in Boston has a nuclear reactor in the middle of the city and where they actually walk through just in normal clothing. Um, Yes, they take some precautions, but they actually get more radioactive um, particles on them outside in normal life than they do inside the the reactor. So that's a a little bit there. So there's a lot of fear-mongering going on and this all stems back to the 70s. Um, here in Australia and then the big problem that we have here is that it is illegal for any organisation to quote, discuss or have any part to do with nuclear energy in Australia. Now this was brought about in 1997, 98 I think. Uh, The legislation's there, it stated 1998 and uh, by John Howard when he was in uh, power and it was to appease, I think it was Bob Carr, not Bob Carr, Tasmanian Green, uh, who was in charge of the Greens, to appease them with some other legislation that they needed through. So consequently, uh, nuclear power was banned federally and it's also banned in states. So for any discussion... um, to do with nuclear power, uh, there has to be state and federal laws abolished, basically, so that companies can come in and talk, quote, and do all of the like. So when you hear this goose, uh, Chris Bowen, and him saying that it's too dear, how does he know? Because he can't get a quote. Uh, we can't go on what happens overseas because there are a few factors that um, they take into consideration that we won't have to. Um, that's to do with the mining and shipping of uranium to power. Um, the reactors. The other part to his... Ab- Disgrace, and he and Anthony Albanese is the same, saying that um, Peter Dutton wants people to glow in the dark. Well, that's the ignorance of these two. The other part to it is that he says that there's no way within ten years that reactors can be built. There's no studies out there that says so. If he goes to his own department, which is the Nuclear uh, Power Technologies, which is one of the, which is ANSTO, which is the Australian Nuclear, whatever it is. I will get the, it's all there, the links are all there. (coughs) And um, let me get the acronym for you up and, so Australian Nuclear, now let me, Put it in here, and so the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation is Australia's national national 
Nuclear Organisation and the Centre of Australian Nuclear Expertise. So that's who they are, which is a government body. Now, in their documentation there, um, to shoot Mr Bowen down, they state that a small nuclear reactor can be built within three to five years and a large nuclear reactor within six to ten years. So stick that one up, you Mr Bowen. You got another one wrong. And the other part that they get wrong to the argument and... I, there is no way in hell that I would drive an electric car, and I'll explain this after this, but he keeps on saying that if we bring uh, change the emission levels on vehicles, then that means that all the other car companies will bring in all their good vehicles that and electric vehicles will get more of them and everything will be wonderful. Uh, no. The reason why, and it happens now with combustion engine vehicles, is that we are too small a market and we are the right hand driving a market, which is only a small minority of driving vehicles around the world. So basically, car manufacturers don't bring in uh, all their models because A, our market is too small, and B, we are right hand drive, whereas a large majority of the world is left-hand drive. So that shoots down his other argument. Now, the other thing that we, Jane and I, noticed, we sort of took note this time, is when we went out to Stanthorpe, and you can watch uh, thoughts and everything and a few things about Stanthorpe uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, so go over to our YouTube channel, just Peter, I think it's Peter G66, is the easiest way to get it, or at or just type in at the Peter George experience on YouTube. So, uh, driver's Subaru Impreza, we uh, filled it up before we went, just with uh, 95 uh, petrol. And Stanthorpe's three-hour drive, so roughly two, three hundred kilometres. From where we live, and uh, we, I'll tell you how far it is to so that no one can pick on me. So, no one can pick on me 254 kilometers to Stanthorpe from where I live. <coughs> so, um, we drove out there, drove around. Um, went to Tenterfield, which is another 50 kilometres. So by the time we got back, we'd done roughly 800 kilometres, or thereabouts. Um, and we were down to, when we got to Aratula, we were about just over half a tank of petrol, or half a tank of petrol thereabouts. It wasn't nowhere near empty, filled up, had something to eat, came home. Now, when we pulled into a few of the places, we could not see electric charging stations anywhere, so they weren't obvious. Um, one thing I did note, though, while we were in Stanthorpe, there was only one petrol station with um, air actually working for your toys, and they actually did it for yourself. So if you're in Stanthorpe, go over the bridge on the right-hand side, there's a little petrol station there, jump in there, and they put the petrol in and do your toys for you. Old-fashioned stuff, which is grouse. So we uh, wouldn't have um, or didn't see an electric power, uh, charging station. There was two in um, Stantle. They were in the back streets. And um, I rang someone that I know in Stantle and they hardly ever work. So... I wouldn't have liked to have done that trip when an average range for a um, an electric car is around about that 400 kilometre. Uh, so that's the, the uh, advertised distance. So you load it up with air conditioning, um, music and everything. That's going to drop down if you're in 
one of the bigger vehicles, it's going to drop even further. So I can understand uh, the electric car anxiety that would have happened because um, all you could do is trickle feed at your accommodation. Uh, There was nothing in Tenerfield that we could see. So once again, Mr Bowen, it's not that easy when you travel. It may be fine for the city, um, but then I watched... um, on YouTube, uh, he's quite a good bloke to to watch. Paul Merrick, uh, car expert, I think his website is. So, and I'll leave a link for this in the show notes as well. Um, he did a test. He was over in um, Los Angeles. And he did a test to charge his vehicle in Los Angeles. And um, in his words, not verbatim, but I'll pull him out of the video. If he didn't have a charger at home, there is no way he would drive an electric vehicle in Los Angeles. He went into a big car park, a Walmart car park. And the queue was horrendous. He waited there for three, four hours for charging and then you got your charge time on top of that. So uh, the electric fantasy continues. Here it is. Um, Our six-hour EV charging disaster. And one of the problems um, that he brings up, uh, Paul, is that all the charging stations are owned by private companies and they don't care whether they're running or not. Um, and the other thing that was quite interesting that they were supposed to be fast charging stations, but depending on how many cars are actually uh, pulling power depends how fast they actually go. So there's another thing. But um, all I can say is, Chris Bowen, if you're fair income um, and even Peter Dutton, he's starting to push the, the nuclear barrow, um, my suggestion is that um, so the gloves are all off, let's first get rid of um, the legislation that doesn't allow for um, nuclear energy. And if a politician turns around and says, oh, it can't be changed, well, you changed it for the nuclear submarines. Um, so you could have it changed and part of the legislation could be that you can't actually use the system for or nuclear for weaponry if that's what you're worried about so they'll throw all of these things at the opposition while they go down the nuclear path then the states have to come on board and if the states don't want to come on board um well bad luck that's their problem um there's ways that they can actually do this to incentivize, but the, the nuts and bolts is the small reactors and large reactors can bolt down into where coal power stations are, use the existing grid, and it's all done. Nothing else has to be built other than the power station. And if people think that we don't have nuclear power here in Australia, we do leaky heights. Um, they do medical grade, and it's quite a big reactor, and it's in... In the burbs. So there we go. So, Mr Bowen, um, as just a simple Aussie, I suggest that you do um, have a little bit of a look. And if you're so sure about all your numbers and everything, if you drop the the legislation so that people can actually start talking about it from a corporate point of view, uh, and you may be able to be, be proven right, you may be able to be proven wrong. But based on Mr. Bowen's um, track record, he'll probably be proven wrong. So let's get into the next part. Now, Spencer Lanou um, called uh, a Broncos player a monkey, and he didn't get away with it. As I said in the podcast, I believe he should have got eight weeks, and guess what he did? He got eight weeks. Um, So normally I'm critical of the NRL, but they've done well here. 
Um, Spencer's excuse was that he didn't know that it was a racial comment. Well, mate, uh, I would say 90% of the population would know it's a racial slur, and so do you. So that was a pretty poor excuse. Um, I think the Roosters asked for four weeks. NRL wanted eight. NRL got the eight, eight weeks, which I think is a fair whack. Um, so hopefully it'll stop any of those comments on the field and we can get on with it. So we've still got to hear about uh, Sam Kerr. Uh, that's still a court case. And the P heart of an individual... Craig Foster, who said that, yeah, they should look at stripping the captaincy um, and went down a logical path about what should happen with Sam Kerr if she's proven to be found guilty, backed it all up and said, no, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, like the lefty, weak individual he is. Never liked him as a player, don't like him as an individual. Um, and, and that's all I'll say about Mr Foster. So... Let's get into the good stuff, the AFL. So Jade and I went and saw Gold Coast versus Richmond and did Gold Coast smash them in the first half. Um, It was, overall, it was quite a level performance um, in the first half from the Suns. They um, ran harder, tackled harder, played a faster game, then Richmond um, could have thought that would have come out. There was a lot of dimmer stuff to it, if you watch Richmond. Um, just fast attack and a fast turnover game. Uh, so at half time it was 11-8 to 2-1. Um, and that one of those goals came in the first 15 seconds when... Uh, Bolton, Shea Bolton kicked the opening goal. Now, the second half or the third quarter, I thought, here we go, the Suns are going to do the the same trick as they always have. Um, But Richmond couldn't keep on playing that bad. Now, one of the things I will say about Richmond is that um, you've got to play uh, Bolter in defence. Uh, he went into the ruck and defence in the third quarter and absolutely killed it. Um, I th- just observing the game, uh, he was the instigator in getting um, Richmond back into it and also the run of um, Willie Rioli. Uh, if you hear him coming, I'd get rid of the ball real quick. But overall, the Suns play pretty good. The, their good football is excellent. Um, I just hope a few things happen. And that is Matty Rao stays fit because what he did with 20 clearances and the endeavour and everything that he showed was unbelievable. Um, took Miller looked out of sorts. Um, yeah, he just... Didn't look like his effective self. Um, I'm just pulling up some numbers so I can... Um, let's have a look at disposals. I'll get. I'll set up my board because I work on effective disposals. You can have 33 touches but none of them are effective. So, Or you can have zero but do other one percenters. Um... So Took Miller, he had 28 disposals, but they didn't have the polish that they normally have. Uh, There's one bloke I always crucify in defence, but uh, Braden, Brandon Ellis, I reckon he's only got a season left in him. Ben King was not too bad. Now, the only thing that I will say about the Suns is... Um, they've got to change their forward thinking a little bit. They leave a very, very big open gap in front of goals when they're setting up from coming in from either either wing. And 
they've got to play the occasional play where a halfback flanker that can kick goals runs into that gap and they get delivered the ball because no one will pick it up. Um, I sit up high. I prefer to sit up high behind the goals so you can actually see what's happening. And this hole just happened time and time again. They've got to utilise that. And they can't play Wits, Casbolt and King all at once. That's my other thing I'd say about the Suns. But they did well. Now, I'm not going to talk about any Victoria clubs ever again. Only the teams that play the Suns. I watched AFL 360 and I watched on the couch. There was a mention of Matty Rowe and that's about it. And there was a little mention on the couch about the Suns. And then you get the likes of Lee Matthews coming out saying, oh, there was nothing in it for the Melbourne teams. No, this is a... It's called AFL for a reason. The A stands for Australian. And if the northern market is still tough for the AFL, they should do everything in their power to promote the game. Now, as I said in the previous show, that they did this to negate round one of the NRL because there's only one team in Victoria. So that's insignificant, whereas there's multiple teams in New South Wales and Queensland, so they had a go. Now, from... I think there was 23,000. looked like there was more at the Suns game. I think uh, all the other games were pretty uh, well attended. So it was a success for those clubs. And Victoria, get stuffed. I've had enough of the it's us, it's us, it's us. If it wasn't for the start of the AFL, there would be no football. Every Victorian club was broke. So the AFL pulled it out of the mire, got it to where it is today, and they can do whatever they like with the game. And it's the Australian Football League. Get your head out of your ass as Victorians. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'm not going to mention it again, and I am never going to mention any other match other than the Suns from here on in um, that's my little protest and um, this is what this, the, the footy side of it's going to be it's only going to be for the Suns and if you want to share that with the Suns football club by all means happy to promote them wherever and ever I can and this is coming from a Hawthorne supporter you won't even hear me talk about Hawthorne um, just over over the ignorance of um, and the same with the NRL, um, they're all the commentators are all Sydney centric. Um, get over yourselves. So, um, this Saturday, ten past seven, at People First Stadium. Now that was a quick uh, change from Heritage Bank Stadium to People First Stadium. And why did that come about? Because Heritage Bank was acquired by people first. So that's why that happened. So on Saturday, top of the table Suns play Adelaide Crows. Um, I think the Crows are going to do quite well this year. And um, the odds are in the Suns' favour. Now I've got to preface this by saying... Uh, I think this was going to be quite a um, close match. And if the Suns play four quarters like they played the first half of the opening round, they will make the eight this year. Um, It was fast, effective football and a very, very speedy back to defence transition as well so um, I think they'll they'll win uh, over the Crows only for the simple fact is that they've got that one game under the belt makes a big difference um, and the Crows haven't played a proper match yet so uh, the teams aren't out um, as yet but for me Suns over the Crows this weekend 
and I will give homage to our neighbouring team and Fremantle play Brisbane Lions over at Optus Stadium. Um, the Lions have to be devastated after being 42 points up or whatever it was and getting rolled by a point. But I think they'll win over there once again under the, the premise that um, that one game under the belt and they're going over to Perth, which is hot and they've got to cope with that. But uh, yet, once again, the two Queensland teams will do well and they will both win this week, not one let the state down. So... That's a wrap for this week's episode. If you've got anything to say, leave comments. Um, Don't be stupid about them with the the nuclear. I'm here to have open debate and smart debate, not uh, tinfoil debates. Um, So, yeah. So, that's a wrap for episode 19 of the Pete. George experience.